I want to begin by reading a rather extraordinary quote from a leading sports broadcaster who works for CBS Sports. And I think it shows that we have reasons for optimism. And it's about a, a terrible incident in which a major NFL football player knocked his girlfriend unconscious, but it was caught on a hidden camera. Now let's be clear, this problem is bigger than football. There has been, appropriately, an intense and widespread outrage following the release of the video showing what happened inside the elevator. But wouldn't it be productive if this collective outrage, as my colleagues have said, could be channeled to truly hear and address the long-suffering cries for help by so many women? And as they said, do something about it, like an ongoing education of men about what healthy, respectful manhood is all about. And then he gives some data. He says, consider this. According to domestic violence experts, more than three women per day lose their lives at the hands of their partners. That means that since the night, February 15th in Atlantic City, more than 600 women have died. OK, so it, my lecture is really more about sexual violence than about domestic violence, but of course, they're closely linked. In 2016, actor Bill Cosby was finally charged with sexual assault. For anyone who's followed the case, one striking aspect is how late an indictment has come, and after a huge number of accusations. One legal problem has been the statute of limitations for rape, an issue that's been much discussed. But another obvious aspect is the fact that as a society, we in the US, and I am going to speak from the US, we have created a class of glamorous and powerful men, entertainers, athletes, who are in a most literal sense above the law. They will almost always prevail against accusations, no matter what they do in the sexual domain, because they are shielded by glamour, public trust, and access to the best legal representation. Cosby might prove the exception only because his abuses of women were so numerous and so flagrant. So what I think as I read the news is, for one Cosby, there are hundreds like him who will never be indicted. And indeed, as I wrote this lecture in February of this year, Cosby himself had just scored a huge legal victory that suggests that he too may escape accountability. Only one other accuser, besides the primary complainant, will be permitted to testify, even though the prosecution had planned to call 13 women out of the dozens who publicly told their stories to show a pattern of conduct. This will make it very difficult to assess the accuser's claim that an obsessive pattern of conduct, drugging followed by rape, had been Cosby's modus operandi for years. The other women are prevented by the statute of limitations from bringing their own charges. Pennsylvania, where the trial will take place, it's in fact right next to the place where I grew up as a little girl, and Cosby once tried to buy the house that my family owned, so this is very close to home, has a longer statute of limitations for rape than other states. Like countless women, and many of them have written to me by now, since I first published this story in the Huffington Post, I have my own Bill Cosby story to tell. In the winter of 1968, when I was an enterprising 20-year-old, I had a big crush on a well-known actor. And at that time, he was playing a major stage role in New York. He was then around 40. After going out with him a couple of times, I asked him back to my off-campus apartment. I had had some sexual experience, but not very much. However, I decided to be daring, since it was the 60s and I felt that I should join the culture. Unlike the Cosby women, I certainly intended to consent to intercourse. What I did not consent to was the gruesome, violent, and painful assault that he substituted for intercourse. I remember screaming for help to no avail, and I remember him saying, it's all part of sex. I never seriously considered going to the police, even though there was lots of forensic evidence. I was just too embarrassed. I didn't even go to a doctor. And I thought with good reason that the police would dismiss the issue because I had, after all, consented to some kind of sex act. Even now, the law is actually not well equipped to handle that type of case 
since consent is usually understood to be an all or nothing matter, despite the fact that there's a world of difference between what I intended to consent to and what happened to me. I've taught rape law and read a large amount on this topic, and I've never found discussion of this question. So this, at least, we can fix with more nuanced accounts of legal consent in the case of violent practices. But the issue I want to focus on is that even had all these problems been solved, the celebrity in question would certainly have prevailed. He would have denied my allegations, cast dispersions on my reputation, even perhaps attempted to portray me as an extortionist. My life, personal and professional, would have been profoundly damaged and nothing would have been accomplished. Not specific deterrence, since I am sure he was undeterrable, shielded by fame as he was, and not general deterrence, since I would have failed. No doubt, dozens of other women have come to the same conclusion about this particular man. In fact, it was only the guardian in the obituary of him that actually said some things about his bad conduct, and none of the American papers. And who knows how many hundreds or thousands about how many hundreds of other male celebrities. So what did I do? After my injuries faded, I decided not to join the culture. I met a lovely man my own age, settled down to a monogamous life, married, and soon had a child. I was very lucky. I have never experienced any sexual trauma from the event, and to this day, I think it has affected me almost not at all, except that I never wanted to watch his TV show, which is not the type that I would normally watch anyway. Perhaps this episode also explains my strong interest in Law and Order SVU, which is my favorite TV show. I've had a very happy life in sexual and other respects. I observed the public enthusiasm for my assailant as an icon of virtuous American fatherhood with ironic detachment. Only 30 years later, when he ran for Congress, did I even consider coming forward with my story just to tell the story, since I thought it was preposterous that he should hold a position of public trust. But close friends assured me that no one would believe me after such a long time, and he would be certain either to portray me as an extortionist or even to sue me for defamation. The famous, of course, are indeed unusually exposed to extortion, and that vulnerability itself is an aspect of their impunity. Everyone easily believes that this is what a complaining woman is after. I consoled myself with the fact that he was, after all, a Democrat, running against an especially vicious Republican opponent. Even he lost, actually. Even now that he's dead, I don't name him because I don't want to be sided, tracked into that question, but also because a Vince Foster case in the US showed us that a person's privacy interests can be held to survive death. And who on earth knows what some court might say about a reputational interest? I note that US, US obituaries, as I said, said nothing about his bad behavior, but the British did. Mine was a selfish and self-protective response. I do wonder whether even a futile complaint could have prevented other harms. But now I want to set this issue in a larger context before returning to the case of celebrity accountability. First, I'll give some general facts about how women are doing around the world. Then I'll zero in on the unsolved problems of sexual violence. I'll describe some, in fact, quite a lot of real progress on even this thorny issue, both in law and in culture. But then I'll return to the recalcitrant case of actors and sports stars, where big money still prevents full accountability. So women are making progress. In 1893, New Zealand became the first nation to offer women the vote. In 2017, every nation of the world has given women the vote. Even Saudi Arabia did so in 2015. In 1900, there was no female member in any national parliament. In 2013, I, that's the most recent I could get, according to the World Bank, the proportion of seats held by women is about 22%, rapidly up from 12% in 1990. And this is the whole world. In educational enrollment and attainment, although some nations still show substantial gaps, women have basically closed the gap worldwide, coming up to parity with men 
in primary and secondary enrollment, and surpassing men in tertiary enrollment. Women's labor force participation is also advancing, although it still lags behind men worldwide. 50.6% is contrasted with 76.7% .7 for males. Although aging women and single female heads of households still exhibit a dramatically higher than average rate of poverty, women are on average slowly rising economically, so that their share of national poverty is right now around 50% in Europe, Latin America, and Africa. In the very basic area of life and health, we also see dramatic improvement. Women's life expectancy at birth has climbed from 54 years in 1960 to 72 years in 2012, about the same increase that we see for men. Women now outlive men in virtually every country. Maternal and infant mortality are rapidly declining, although there are still severe problems in some countries. Women appear to enjoy nutritional status in childhood similar to that of males. We see few disparities in immunizations or rates of communicable disease. Even HIV affects women and men more or less equally. A lot of this progress comes from development and greater affluence, but women's relative status has improved even in many nations that are still lagging behind in overall economic development. There are two especially recalcitrant issues. One of them is women's burden of care work in the household. A vastly disproportionate amount of childcare, elder care, and domestic labor is currently done worldwide by women. The rare case is where the woman is hired and paid a wage, and even such women are exploited because the wage for work perceived as women's work is not adequate, but a large proportion of such work is done for free by women, and they are supposed to be doing it out of love. This is just how things are. There are many issues here. The burden of the so-called double day, where women work a full-time job and then they come home and do this other work. The failure of economic accounting to count this work as work or to assign to it a monetary value. The consequent devaluation of women's work in many contexts, such as divorce or damage suits. But that's not my topic today. The other exceedingly recalcitrant issue is sexual violence. According to the 2014 Human Development Report, which focused on this question, about one third of the world's women will experience sexual or other related physical violence in their lifetime, usually from an intimate partner. Good data are, of course, very hard to come by, but it is clear that the problem is not endemic to poorer nations and that the rate in the United States is appallingly high, as I'll describe later. Even on these issues, however, once highly controversial or worse, neglected as just the way family life is, there's an emerging international consensus that violence against women ought to be taken very seriously. Male business as usual is no longer business as usual. Rape, domestic violence, and sexual harassment still occur with depressing regularity, but they are publicly deplored as they were not earlier. They are big news when once they were just nature. When Boko Haram kidnaps young women, this event, the sort of thing that has occurred for centuries without protest, is now the object of worldwide international protest. The former Prime Minister of Italy, Enrico Letta, shines a spotlight on the frequency of domestic violence, stalking, and killings motivated by male jealousy by saying that Italy is, quote, at war against femicide, quite a striking term, thus placing the crimes in a category comparable to that of genocide, as feminists have, in fact, long argued. He followed this up with tough new laws. Even in one of those still quite primitive and patriarchal nations, the United States, there is movement. For years, rape on college campuses, fueled by alcohol and the toxic atmosphere created by big time college sports, had gone virtually unreported as complainants were routinely dissuaded from pursuing their complaints. In his last two years in office, President Obama, but actually the leader was Vice President Joe Biden, a longtime feminist, directed attention to this issue, launching a campaign against campus sexual assault 
and even publishing a list of 55 especially problematic institutions on which, I'm sorry to say, the University of Chicago figured. And lately, wonder of wonders, the most all-American institution of all, the National Football League, is writhing in distress after a wave of domestic violence issues involving prominent players. And quite a few of those players have been dropped and no one re-signs them. So, of course, it isn't as though these things are really new events. It's the climate of their reception from fans, from politicians, sports journalists, and perhaps most important, from the league's corporate sponsors that has undergone a virtual revolution. When you listen to, there's this program called The Score, which is a sports talk radio show in Chicago that I like to listen to because I am a sports fan. Um, it's quite astonishing. You might almost be at a 1980s feminist consciousness raising session run by Andrea Dworkin. <laughs> Even beer has joined the women's movement. On Tuesday, September 16th, 2015, NFL corporate sponsor Anheuser-Busch stated, quote, we are disappointed and increasingly concerned by the recent incidents that have overshadowed the NFL, that's National Football League, season. We are not yet satisfied with the league's handling of behaviors that so clearly go against our own company culture and moral code. Wow, either staggering hypocrisy or revolutionary change. And in a sense, even hypocrisy would itself be a revolutionary change, reflecting deference to new social norms and new consumers. So let me now briefly trace the evolution of law and social norms toward greater accountability and then show what, still, what fight we still need to win. So I'm going to talk about only the US, but I think similar developments are true here. So let me describe first the current dimensions of the problem. The most recent National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, puts the incidence of sexual violence in the United States even higher than previous studies. Nearly one in five women surveyed said they had been raped or had experienced an attempted rape, and one in four reported having been beaten by an intimate partner. One in six women have been stalked. Sexual violence is, of course, not only toward women, but it affects women disproportionately. One third of women said they had been victims of some form of sexual assault. One in seven men have experienced sexual violence, and one in 71 have been raped, usually when very young. More than half of female rape victims were raped by an intimate partner and 40% by an acquaintance, at least. Nor are these numbers unconnected to traditional patriarchal attitudes. Edward Lauman, one of the great sociologists of our era, found some highly disturbing facts in his exhaustive study of American sexual attitudes and experience published in The Social Organization of Sexuality and then its more popular cousin, Sex in America. So here's what Ed Lauman found. And I emphasize that Lauman is no radical and not even a feminist. He's a very conservative, quantitative scholar of impeccable um, sort of respectability within the academy. So first, American men widely share a picture of male sexuality as easily aroused and then uncontrollable. Once aroused, a man just can't stop. Women are commonly seen as temptresses whose very presence and whose physical allure makes men lose control. And after that, they just aren't responsible for what they do. Men combine this belief with a related myth about women, that they really want sex even when they say they don't, and even when they fight against it. Lauman came to the following conclusion about how these attitudes lead to problematic acts of aggression. And I quote, although clearly sexual interactions between men and women are fraught with ambiguity and potential conflict, there's something more going on than a few misunderstandings. There seems to be not just a gender gap, but a gender chasm in perceptions of when sex was forced. We find that large numbers of women say they have been forced by men to do something sexually that they did not want to do, but very few men report ever forcing a woman. The differences that men and women bring to the sexual situation 
and the differences in their experience of sex sometimes suggest that there are two separate sexual worlds, his and hers. Specifically, Laumann found that 22% of women were forced sexually at some time after age 13, and only 0.6% were forced by another woman, and only 2% of men were forced. All but 4% of these women knew the man who was forcing them, and nearly half said they were in love with him. Men, by contrast, overwhelmingly denied using force. Only 3% said they forced a woman, and 0.2% said they forced a man. Some, of course, are probably lying, but Laumann and his co-authors plausibly argue that the huge disparities cannot be explained away in this manner. There was a lot of protection for anonymity in the study. They suggest that a more likely explanation is, quote, most men who forced sex did not recognize how coercive the women thought their behavior was, end quote. They, they think about, the, as an example, the husband who comes home drunk from a night out with the boys, wanting sex now and thinking it is due, the young man on a date with a sexy woman who makes and accepts some advances but says no to intercourse, and conclusion, quote, he thinks the sex they have was consensual, she thinks it was forced. Well, law can't change culture on its own, obviously. But we'll now see that law has aided and abetted some of these problems, defining some acts of sexual violence as not problematic. But we'll also see, however, that by the late by the 1970s, law began to be a force for change. Before the <coughs> feminist challenge to criminal law that began in the 1970s, a woman complaining of rape was required to show that the man involved had used physical force and force additional to the force requisite to consummate the sexual act itself. The mere threat of force was often considered insufficient, although the threat of death or grave bodily injury usually was. Usually, too, the woman had to show that she had resisted, even in the face of force or the threat of force, since only this so-called earnest resistance was taken as evidence of non-consent. Some states made resistance a formal statutory requirement, but more often it was read into the statutes as a requirement implicit in the notions of force and non-consent. The old requirement was that the victim should resist, quote, to the utmost, end quote. More recently, this was replaced by terms such as reasonable resistance or earnest resistance. Typical of its period was a New York statute of 1965 saying that rape is committed only when the man uses, quote, physical force that overcomes earnest resistance, end quote, or makes a threat of, quote, immediate death or serious physical injury, end quote. A woman who did not resist physically or who succumbed to lesser threats was treated as consenting, and the man's conduct was not criminal at all. The standard produced bizarre results. In one case, the victim said she submitted to intercourse because the man threatened her with a knife or a box cutter. She got the weapon away from him, then submitted to intercourse a second time when he choked her and told her that he could kill her. A 1973 New York appellate court set aside the man's conviction, saying, quote, rape is not committed unless the woman opposes the man to the utmost limit of her power. The resistance <coughs> must be genuine. <clears throat> genuine and active. It is difficult to conclude that the complainant here waged a valiant struggle to uphold her honor. These stringent requirements were criticized by law enforcement professionals who believed it unwise for women to fight back in situations of attack. Nonetheless, even in 1981, in a case in which the defendant took away a woman's car keys in a dangerous area of town, lightly choked her and made menacing gestures, a lower court concluded that the woman had not resisted enough to establish non-consent. Although the conviction was reinstated on appeal, a three-vote minority in the 4-3 decision said of the victim, quote, she must, value the, she must uh, follow the natural instinct of every proud female to resist by more than mere words the violation of her person by a stranger or an unwelcome friend. Notice the strange asymmetry between the treatment of sexual crime and our standard attitudes to property crime. 
If I remove your wallet without your express affirmative permission, I am committing theft. I cannot defend myself by pointing to the fact that you failed to put up a fight. But if a man had intercourse with a woman invading her intimate bodily space, our system thought it a crime only if she offered physical resistance frequently in the face of danger. Nor does a conviction of theft require showing that the thief used more force than was necessary to extract the wallet, although, of course, such force may be an aggravating factor. Again, a high school principal who says, give me $200 or you won't graduate, is held to be guilty of extortion. A plaintiff who said her principal had said, sleep with me or I, you won't graduate, no crime. Okay. So it was only in 1992, in an unusual ruling, that a New Jersey court held, explicitly rejecting prior tradition, that the element of force in rape was established simply by, quote, an act of non-consensual penetration involving no more force than necessary to accomplish that result. The analogy to property crime, by the way, is developed in the academic literature very powerfully by many people, but my own colleague, uh, Steve Schulhofer, I used to teach with before he moved uh, to New York University, wrote an important book called Unwanted Sex, The Culture of Intimidation and the Failure of Law that developed this uh, parallel at length. Moreover, a woman who brought a rape charge would typically be subjected to humiliating questioning about her previous sexual history. It was oddly assumed that the fact that a woman was not chaste was evidence of consent to the particular sexual act in question. Why would such an assumption be made? When we encounter a friend dining at a fine restaurant, we usually do not infer that he or she would love to have a plate of rancid, moldy broccoli ran down her throat. And yet, it is just this sort of reasoning that pervaded most rape trials. It would appear that the inference reflects a picture of women as divided into two groups, either chaste or whores with whom anything is permitted. These pictures of women have deep roots in our entire culture, coloring the ways in which we see or missee particular events. As eminent a cultural authority as Dr. Johnson once said to Boswell, the one great principle that a woman should learn is to keep her legs together. When once a woman has given up that principle, she has given up every other. This idea is certainly at work in the perception that a woman who doesn't struggle at some risk to herself has consented and has no right to complain. These beliefs are greatly enhanced by pornographic depictions of women. Women whose non-chastity implies consent to anything and everything exist in pornography, but they do not exist in reality, except in the limiting case of a person whose selfhood is so broken down by repeated ill treatment that she can no longer assert choice and selfhood at all. These judgments about women also colored the interpretation of the mental element of rape. Men who hold these stereotypical views of women widely disseminated through pornographic depictions and many other cultural sources, may actually come to believe that a woman who says no is consenting to intercourse. The question the law typically had to face, as we've seen, is whether such beliefs were reasonable. The standard of the reasonable is notoriously elusive and frequently serves as a screen onto which judges project their own, often male, ideas of appropriate social norms Many will recall the rape trial of boxer Mike Tyson, at which he claimed unsuccessfully that the willingness of the woman named only as DW to accompany him to his room was sufficient to make his belief in her consent to intercourse reasonable, despite the evidence of her vigorous objections and her many attempts to escape. Such beliefs about consent were not found reasonable in that year, which was 1993, earlier they probably would have been in a 1982 case in which a group of doctors from Boston took a nurse bodily to a car, drove her up to Rockport, which is a rather deserted place, and had intercourse with her over repeated protests. Justice Brown of the Massachusetts Appellate Court commented that it was high time to reject the defense of reasonable mistake as to consent in cases like this. 
he wrote, it is time to put to rest the societal myth that when a man is about to engage in sexual intercourse with a, quote, nice, end quote, woman, quote, a little force is always necessary, end quote. I'm prepared to say that when a woman says no to someone, any implication other than a manifestation of non-consent that might arise in that person's psyche is legally irrelevant and thus no defense. In 1985, I find no social utility in establishing a rule defining non-consensual intercourse on the basis of the subjective and quite likely wishful view of the more aggressive player in the sexual encounter. As Justice Brown recognized, men often indulge in wishful thinking about women's desires and whether hypocritically or sincerely convince themselves that aggressive behavior is what the situation calls for. If we interpret the reasonable in reasonable mistake in line with prevailing social norms, we encourage this sort of wishful thinking. Justice Brown announces a truly radical conclusion. When a woman says no, it is never reasonable in the legal sense to believe that she means yes. These false beliefs had a large effect on law and public policy. They informed men's sexual desires and behavior, as when the knowledge that a woman is not chaste gave rise to an assumption that she would do it with anyone, as when arousal by a woman's clothing, gestures, or kissing was taken to license the use of sexual force. They also shaped the desires and preferences of women in many harmful ways. Women who had been raped, however violent and non-consensual the incident, felt shamed and sullied and frequently did not even consider turning to the law for help. Often guilt about their own sexual desires or about having consented to kissing or petting made women feel that they had asked for it, even when the rape involved violence and substantial physical damage. In addition, women who had consented to intercourse, who do, and this is my case, who had not consented to acts of violence within intercourse, also felt it impossible to complain, since the reigning view was that a woman who said yes to intercourse had no right to complain about anything. These frequently tragic reactions were caused by a kind of distortion in belief and desire that the feminist movement of the 1970s exposed, arguing repeatedly that female sexual desire and attractiveness are not a way of asking for it, that the only thing that counts as asking for it is a woman's expressed consent to the acts in question, just as the only way of asking for someone to take your wallet is to take it out and give it to that person without intimidation or threat, either explicit or implicit. It seems clear that this critique has exposed damaging falsehoods, although much more work needs to be done to achieve a legal system that adequately protects women's choices. A watershed moment in the feminist legal struggle was the 1983 case of Cheryl Araujo, subject of the 1988 film, The Accused, starring Jodie Foster. I think it's one of the best films about law. I show it to my students to give them hop, optimism and hope. Uh, this film is very faithful to the case, with only one change. The male rapists were, in fact, working class Portuguese men, but in the film they're college fraternity boys. And I think this choice was wise, because the aim was to avoid denigrating men of a particular ethnic origin, but to portray rape culture as universal, as indeed it is. So, the events took place in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Cheryl Araujo, age 21, height 5 feet 5 inches, weight 110 pounds, walked into Big Dan's bar to buy cigarettes. I now quote from the trial record, quote, the facts the jury could have found are as follows. On the evening of March 6, 1983, a young woman, victim, entered Big Dan's tavern in New Bedford to purchase cigarettes. While there, she ordered a drink and engaged in a brief conversation with another woman patron. The two women also conversed with and observed the pool game of co-defendants Cordero and Raposo. There were approximately 15 men in the tavern. Sometime after the other women left Big Dan's, the victim also prepared to leave. Cordero and Raposo offered to give her a ride home, which she declined. While the victim was standing in the area of the bar, Sylvia and Vieira approached her from behind, knocked her to the floor, and removed her pants as Cordero and Raposo tried to force the victim to perform fellatio. 
Sylvia and Viera then dragged the victim, kicking and screaming, and swung her onto the pool table. There, Sylvia penetrated her vaginally while she was restrained at various points by Cordero, Raposo, and Viera. After Sylvia got, got off the victim, he held her by the hair as Viera got on top of her. While restrained on the pool table, Cordero again attempted to force the victim to perform fellatio. Eventually, clothed only in a shirt and one shoe, the victim escaped and ran into the street where she flagged down a passing truck. She testified, quote, I was screaming for help. I was begging them to leave me alone, to let me go. They wouldn't do it. In the background, she said, she heard boisterous cries of men shouting, do, do. The defendants testified that she had led them on, dancing with them and returning their kisses. Despite the court's efforts to shield her, because now rape victims may not, their names should not be publicized, Araujo's name was repeatedly broadcast on cable TV. Leading feminists gathered to talk about the case, and it became a national coast celeb. In the end, four defendants were convicted of rape. Two others were acquitted. One of the jurors said, she wasn't the greatest of women. She probably egged them on to some degree, and they lost control. But after she said no, she was violated. That's how they broke the law. Quite a radical shift in the middle of that sentence. The juror's utterance is confused. It includes the time-honored idea that when men are led on, they will lose control. But then it veers around to a different idea. She said no, and that means that when they went ahead, she was violated, and they broke the law. Like that juror's remark, the case was a true turning point in US law and a major occasion of public education. It established that no means no. Under the pressure of this feminist critique, rape law has changed considerably, increasingly reflecting the insight, first um, the books in New Jersey, that a woman's no means that she does not consent and does not mean that she is playing games and asking for it and that her prior sexual history is irrelevant to the question of consent on this particular occasion. In fact, it may not be introduced into evidence. Change has been slow, and there are many problems to solve. So what are some of those? First, the longstanding emphasis on no means no does not yet enable the law to grapple well with cases in which the victim is silent out of fear or because she's in a solitary place or think of the, the woman whose car keys were snatched in a dangerous area of the city. And there remains a tendency to suppose that silence expresses consent. Note that we would never think that a patient's silence in response to a question about whether he wanted a medical procedure was evidence of consent to that procedure. A doctor would be culpable if he simply went ahead and did the procedure claiming that the patient had expressed consent by silence. Our failure to think similarly about women probably betrays the legacy of the social myths that I've talked about. The law has not yet figured out how to articulate the idea of consent in a consistent manner that protects a woman's sexual autonomy in cases where there's implicit threat, extortionate demands like the high school principal, and so forth. Second. No means no, and this is, I've already touched on this, uh, also doesn't enable us to deal well with the extortionate use of power. The use by, let's say, psychiatrists, high school principals, authority figures of all kinds of that power to extort sexual intercourse. So the woman didn't fear physical force, but she submitted to an extortionate demand that would clearly have been illegal in the financial area. Sexual harassment laws do intervene at that point, but in the US, sexual harassment is a tort. It's not a criminal offense. So still, there's a lot that remains to be done. And third, date rape. The beliefs about a woman asking for it are still highly operative here. Men see petting or even kissing as an invitation to intercourse and are outraged if they're expected to stop. Where sexual violence on campus is at issue, we are currently grappling with these issues, but with many confusions and uncertainties. The new guidelines under the law that's called Title IX, which applies to campuses, under which we now all work, establish mandatory reporting. The minute a student makes a faculty or administrator aware 
that she has experienced any sexual misconduct, the faculty member or the administrator is required to report it to the Title IX coordinator, who then confers with the victim and decides how to proceed. The victim certainly is not required to press charges, and she may ask for complete confidentiality. Usually, if she doesn't want to press charges, they will not be pressed, since there's typically no other evidence. If she does, then there's a lengthy process in which the accused is asked for a statement, the accuser and witnesses also submit their statements, and the Title IX panel reaches a determination of some type. In one case I've been dealing with all this past year, I think the process worked very well. Uh, namely, the women's grievance of inappropriate touching. It wasn't, it wasn't sexual assault as such, but inappropriate groping at a public event led to probation for the male student in question, together with mandatory sex and alcohol counseling, which seemed a balanced result. But the procedures still raise difficult questions. And here are some of the questions in this area. First, how can confidences be protected when there's mandatory reporting? I'm worried that women I know, graduate students, even undergraduate, will be less likely to open up to me or to other faculty, knowing that I'm now legally obliged to report it and name her, even though, in principle, the Title IX office says it will protect confidentiality. Second, there's a huge question about the standard of proof. Title IX recommends that the standard should be the preponderance of the evidence, not reasonable doubt. Miscarriages of justice can easily occur. A group of law academics, uh, particularly at Harvard Law School, after a very difficult case involving a, a very promising lower working class African American student who was convicted by the preponderance of the evidence, but it looked like a miscarriage of justice. So a group of faculty signed a statement for testing the standard and recommending reasonable doubt. Third, is the Title IX process really right to require affirmative consent, and what exactly is that? Schulhofer and many others have made excellent points about the shortcomings of no means no, and yet the idea that sex will be turned into a ritual in which each and every step must be preceded by explicit verbal permission seems both chilling and unrealistic to many people, and also almost inapplicable when both parties are very drunk. I'm on the Schulhofer side here, but one can see the point of view of critics who suggest that affirmative consent has gone too far. Fourth, are campus tribunals really equipped to deal with these issues? It's easy to see why Title IX wants universities to do that. If nothing happened unless the complainant were willing to go to the police, very few cases would be prosecuted. Women don't trust the police, and they fear the inevitable loss of privacy and confidentiality that would ensue. But people's lives are now in the hands of people without often, I mean, the Title IX coordinator has legal training, but the panel that hears all the cases from undergraduates is just faculty, a couple of law professors, but you know, most of them have no legal training. And it's only the rare campus that subsidizes free legal representation for the accused. Columbia does that, but um, that's the exception. So we're grappling with these questions. They're tough and subtle. That we have reached this place is a tremendous victory. It means that we have achieved consensus on a lot of really difficult things and are now pushing the frontier toward greater accountability with regard to some thorny issues that have not yet been dealt with. But now I turn to celebrities. Some especially serious sexual crimes, serial predation of a very damaging sort, still face no accountability. And now we return to professional sports and to my Huffington Post piece. We've reached a further frontier in terms of accountability. Private citizens who rape women are typically, or at least very frequently, held accountable. Even politicians now face accountability since politicians are actually expendable. There are plenty of them. But there are certain people who have talents that make a lot of money for other people. And those people are typically shielded from accountability. 
Sports stars are not fungible. They have big talents, difficult to replace, and those talents make lots of money for other people. Media stars and actors might have been expendable and replaceable at one time in their career. After all, for every role, there are probably several hundred out-of-work actors who could play that role very well. But once actors become stars, they are no longer fungible, and studios and investors have a lot invested in them. More generally, we live in the United States in a culture of celebrity, which makes these people think that they are above the law, sometimes from a very early age. Things are worse with athletes because the corrupting effect of big money talent sets in very early. They're groomed from high school on. They're pampered in colleges and universities, big scholarships. And they're made to feel that the rules for other people don't apply to them. They're encouraged to deceive. Thus, US colleges, pretty much all the colleges that have big time sports teams, give fake classes and fake grades to athletes. And the athletes understand that faculty are their collaborators and that they're lying to protect them from academic accountability. As for sex, they're often recruited in situations that positively encourage sexual misconduct. Women are virtually pimped out to athletes that universities are trying to recruit. And most big sports universities have no shame about acting as pimps in this way. So from a very young age, they live in a culture of deceit and sexual corruption. Actors learn corruption somewhat later, although the very real corruption of sleeping your way to a role is surely a bad influence on younger actors. Let me now mention one further issue, I alluded to it previously, which makes accountability much more difficult. It is the ever-present possibility that superstars will be lied about for purposes of extortion, which really does muddy the waters. We know that sometimes celebrities are guilty as charged, but sometimes not. I believe, for example, maybe it's just because I'm a Chicago sports fan, the charges of sexual assault against the basketball star Derrick Rose were probably false and were made in order to extort money. I mean, I've studied the case, so I don't just do it as a fan. But he courageously contested them, and a court found in his favor. But no doubt, for every case where the person is innocent, and of course, this is just my conclusion, which could be wrong, there are many more where the person is guilty and defends himself by raising the extortion issue. I've mentioned some athletes who did face accountability, the one who beat up his girlfriend in the elevator. One salient case was that man, Ray Rice. Uh, and uh, the misconduct was so obvious on the camera, I mean, knocked the woman unconscious, that no one could doubt it. In a few other similar cases, the conduct has been documented beyond dispute. But these cases don't really show that big money stars aren't above the law, because what we see is that women are still not empowered to bring charges and are treated very badly by the authorities when they do come forward. Consider Cosby's case, where many women tried hard over the years to press charges against him, but one by one, they had no success in establishing culpability, though some did receive financial settlements. This past year, it's only the overwhelming number of cases with a precisely similar pattern that finally caused Cosby to lose his many honors and his his honorary degrees, his university appointments, and many lucrative opportunities. And now one prosecution, the only one not blocked by the statute of limitations, is going forward. Most cases are not like this. And even this case, which looks like success, has so many twists and turns, as you see, so can't predict with confidence that he will be convicted. Surely the Long Cosby saga has been draining and terrible for the women involved because of the great power of the celebrity machine that used to protect him. Now, Cosby is now 79 years old. His acting career was over even before it was ended by the revelations about him. It is, I think, no accident that people stopped defending him just when he was not making money for them anyway. Now, as my last grim exhibit, let me consider a case where big money is at stake and credible allegations don't get taken seriously the case of Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston is an extremely gifted quarterback 
who began his fame while at Florida State University and since 2015 has played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers of the NFL. He is 6'4 and weighs 227 pounds. He is 23 years old. He has broken the franchise's record for passing yards and passing touchdowns in a single season. And he's the first quarterback in NFL history to start his career with consecutive seasons of 4,000 yards passing. He holds several other records I won't bother to enumerate. So he is a big talent. And he, you know, comes from a poor African-American background. So that's also compounds the issue. Now, the facts about sex and non-accountability. On November 14, 2013, the state attorney of the Second Judicial Circuit announced that they were opening an investigation into a sexual assault complaint involving Winston that was originally fired, filed with the Tallahassee City Police Department in 2012. The complaint was originally investigated by the city police and classified as inactive in February 2013 with no charges filed. The police report containing the complainant's original statement was posted by uh, the Tallahassee Police Department, but they did nothing about it. They stated that the complaint was made inactive, quote, when the victim in the case broke off contact with TPD and her attorney indicated that she did not want to move forward at that time. And then, that, since that was just a bald-faced lie, the case was re-examined after media requests for information started pouring in. Note the importance, great importance of the media in pressuring recalcitrant institutions for real accountability. In December 2013, State Attorney Willie Meggs announced the completion of the investigation and that no charges would be filed against anyone in the case, citing, quote, major issues with the woman's testimony. Meggs stated, quote, as prosecutors, we only bring charges for cases where the evidence will result in a likely conviction at trial. In this case, the evidence does not show that, end quote. Allegations of improper police conduct were made with the complainant claiming to have been pressured into dropping her claim. And then in retaliation, Winston's attorney alleged inappropriate links, leaks to the media. Florida State's policy, and it's a real big sports school, is that athletes charged with a felony cannot play until their case is disposed of. But Winston continued to play throughout the investigation because he had never been charged. On April 16, 2014, the New York Times got into it and reported irregularities in the rape investigation involving Winston. The complainant developed bruises. It turns out, I mean, this is long ago by now. And semen had been found on her underwear. So all of that evidence was there. A month later, the complainant identified Winston by name as her attacker. Tallahassee police contacted Winston. This is all the New York Times recapitulation. No DNA sample was taken from Winston until the prosecutor took over the case months later. Once it was taken, it was found to match the DNA that was found in the complainant's underwear. The investigation was conducted by an officer who did private security work for the Seminole Boosters, who were the alumni club who were the primary financiers of Florida State Athletics. The official FSU hearing presided over by Florida retired Supreme Court Justice Major B. Harding in December 2014 cleared Winston of violating the student conduct code in the sexual assault case. And he said, I do not find the credibility of one story substantially stronger than that of the other. Both have their strengths and weaknesses. I cannot find with any confidence that the events as set forth by you, the accuser, or a particular combination thereof, is more probable than not, as required to find you responsible for a violation of the code. Therein lies the determinative factor of my decision. So that was it for criminal charges. However, in January 2016, the university paid the accuser nine hundred fifty thousand dollars to settle a civil suit she brought against the university so kind of an admission of fault the accuser who 
had by that time publicly identified herself as Erica Kinsman, also filed a civil suit against Winston himself in April 2014, and Winston had countersued her for defamation and tortious interference. And in a September 2015 ruling, a federal judge dismissed Winston's tortious interference claim, but declined a motion to dismiss his claim for defamation. Winston and Kinsman's respective suits were combined, and they're scheduled for the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Florida to begin in May of this year. Meanwhile, in the fall of 2015, Winston began his stellar pro career. Now, I'm not a retributivist. I think the appropriate goals of criminal law in this and other cases are specific deterrence, general deterrence, incapacitation, and reform. It's pretty obvious that general deterrence has not been served here. Other athletes see from this case, where after all, the evidence was so black and white, that if you are a big talent, you're above the law. University officials and rich alumni will pay to protect you. But what about specific deterrence and reform? <sighs> On February 23rd, 2017, so just as I was drafting this lecture, Winston made a guest appearance at a St. Petersburg, Florida elementary school, the type of goodwill thing that athletes do to show that they're good people and to help public relations for the sport. During his motivational talk, he said, all my boys stand up, all my ladies, you can sit down, but all my boys stand up, we strong, right? We strong, we strong, right? All my boys, tell me one more time, I can do anything I put my mind to. A lot of boys aren't supposed to be soft-spoken. You know what I'm saying? One day, y'all are going to have a very deep voice like this, and then he speaks very deep. One day, you'll have a very, very deep voice. But the ladies, they're supposed to be silent, polite, and gentle. My men, my men supposed to be strong. School officials and parents were very upset. And <laughs> on February 24th, of the day I wrote this paragraph, Winston apologized for his, quote, poor word choice. <laughs> so here we see someone utterly undeterred, unreformed, unreformable. And I would also add, you know, obviously not educated, and he, he went through college and, and didn't learn how to construct a sentence. Um, <laughs> even when his goal is to motivate students to strive, the only way he finds to express that idea is a set of sexist stereotypes. And guess what stereotypes? Male force, male strength, female silence, and non-resistance. But then, why would Winston be deterred or educated when a public university, using taxpayer money, paid out a million of those dollars, taxpayer dollars, to settle a complaint involving him, and when at every step in the road, powerful university officials and alumni, those seminal boosters, were conniving to corrupt the justice system. I almost feel sorry for James Winston since he had been exploited throughout his life. I actually think there's a racist aspect to the exploitation too, so it's complicated. Um, used as a tool for the enrichment of rich white people and never permitted to get a decent education. And then, no doubt, already he's on the road to a horrible later life of dementia from CTE. Corrupt university officials and alumni are as much in need of accountability as he, and indeed, I think more so, since they are almost certainly serial offenders, and maybe he won't be. Now, I, I note that other universities behave much better. Baylor University, when the sexual assault cases came to light, not only dismissed their football coach and assistant coaches, but they also dismissed Kenneth Starr, whom you know from the prosecution of Bill Clinton in the impeachment hearings. Kenneth Starr, an evangelical, was president of that university, and he was fired from that position. So that was actually quite a lot of accountability. The longer history I've narrated contains many signs of hope, both for culture and for law. Law has indeed been an active participant in changing rape culture, but there is unfinished business in a culture of celebrity, and especially where celebrities make money for other people, accountability is proving elusive unless the public rises up.
After all, both sports and theater depend on all of us. And we can already see the results of public outcry in the Ray Rice incident, in the attitudes expressed on sports talk shows, in the behavior of beer, of Budweiser beer. Really. The sports leagues have already shown their deference to public opinion in such very laudable actions as their boycott of the state of North Carolina over that state's recent anti-LGBT law. And I think that's quite remarkable. And their threatened boycotts of other states like Texas that are currently considering such laws. Both leagues and corporate sponsors are our hope for the future. Winston's past misconduct was sheltered because the old boys club of Florida State University was determined to protect their rare star. But I actually believe that at this point, if he were to behave in a similar way in the National Football League, things would be different because the good old boys don't hear women's voices. But beer and the NFL do seem to at least sometimes. Consumers are powerful in a consumer culture, and we are all consumers. Both sports leagues and their corporate sponsors are accountable to us, to a large and diverse public. They need to hear all the time from people who care about women, who care about LGBT people, about general decency of conduct. So I would applaud that broadcaster, James Brown, that I started the lecture with, and other sportscasters who keep the heat on the league and the sponsors. Brown is the host of NFL Today and also of Thursday Night Football, so he's a very influential figure. Let's express outrage about bad apples like Winston, but let's not stop with the past. As Brown rightly said, outrage is useful only if it leads to a real project, really coming to hear fully women's voices and really telling the leagues, the corporate sponsors, the players and the parents of future players, to use Brown's words, quote, what healthy, respectful manhood is all about. Thanks.